Thanks very much. That's a tremendous set of talks there. Very wide, diverse set of subjects. And we've got quite a lot of questions coming through. It's wonderful to see, by the way, hundreds of people uh, watching this and also sticking through as well throughout. They've been really been gripping talks. Now let's go back to Gary's first talk. Uh, Gary, the archivist, Gary Brannan. Now, a, a couple of questions which are kind of related. I'll put them to you as, as a kind of a bundle, Gary. Um, one thing that struck me when I was watching the talk was you showed that photograph of your predecessors at the Institute. And yes, they were all middle-aged um, men. And we know that it, it, historically, a lot of these institutions have been one, run by white men. And also perhaps a lot of what people have collected have been driven by those interests. So there's the questions now I think people have about, first of all, and this is what uh, an anonymous, anonymous attendee asked from the audience, given how much focus there now is rightly about history and decolonization and so forth. What role can archives and archivists play in enhancing public understanding of the murkier aspects of our history? Do these archives leave out those murky aspects or um, are they there for us? And, and perhaps not only thinking about what these archives have been about the past, now making them available. How are we now making these things available to as wide a range of people as possible? And Paul Rainwright from the audience has asked a question about digitization. I think that's a, a big element of that. How do you prioritize what gets digitized and how do you ensure it gets as wide a view as possible? So a couple of questions for you, Gary, but perhaps you can pick them up as you'd like. Sure, yeah. Um... Okay, so take, taking the, the the meaty one first, so the one that uh, relates to issues like decolonization and, and, and our story, I always put it that archivists are there to allow and enable the questions about who we are as people to be asked. How we as people, as a society, respond to those answers or indicators when they are found is, is is a thing that society needs to deal with. And that is something that is happening right now. I mean, th there is a thing that, that, that does come through quite strongly here that archives do reflect to some extent their creators. And when you're talking about records of the church, they are mostly going to have been created and by, in our case, white men. So part of that is the intelligent kind of source criticism aspects that you get through things like being at university and everything like that and, and deliver and, and and teaching those skills and people to criticize and really critically question sources because people uh, often often the best stories in archives happens in the silences it happens in the bits that aren't written it happens in the bit that's alluded to and part of that is the work that we do in cataloging and making these archives available so part of that is cataloging and part of that is digitization to allow these archives to be discovered so that people can come and ask those questions of these sources and the difficult questions that there may be. So, for instance, one of the benefits and the very few benefits, I imagine, from a lot of what's happened over the last 12 months is that we've been able to really invest time in getting more catalogue descriptions online and adding locational markers. So where we have quite a lot of records for India, for instance, in our Halifax archive and records for Southern Africa that we hold as part of the archives of the former Centre for Southern African Studies at the university, getting those online, allowing them to be discovered and having people come and see them. So not being that gatekeeper in any sense and accepting as a profession that we have more to do in recognising our role in this so that's something we're doing at the Borthwick as well we have a very successful reading group that's looking specifically at issues of decolonization and taking the lead from marginalized communities and working with marginalized communities to, to help people see their their role and responsibilities in that so a lot of that is really questioning those sources and looking in the silence and and, and, and the unwritten bit to find those voices in terms of making things available through digitization and how we how we do that i mean there's a variety of factors that come into that one of them is is it is it physically fit for digitization some things just aren't they could be too fragile i won't i won't survive it and part of that is looking at that source in in its kind of effort for impact sense is, is it is it is it efficient does it have a lot of information in there that can help people discover more about themselves? It's a very tricky decision. You, it's very, going to be very difficult to digitise everything in an archive. We've had a go. We've done it with one of our archives, the, the archive of the retreat, so the, the hospital next to the university. Its archive is very, very a high proportion of that is digitised right down to individual receipts and memos and letters. But digitization is one part of that. It's not just about digitising it and sticking it online and therefore people come. 
it's about getting a strategy to engage people as well and bringing people to use that source, appreciate it, find it and discover it because there's always more to find and it, it can be quite difficult. And you do see the benefits of digitization. So I mentioned the Northern Way project that's based around the Archbishop's Registers as an example of how digitization and putting things online changes things. Uh, in the 10 years before we did that project, the, the, the images went online in 2015. We had 10 users in 10 years. We're like into the 80, 90,000 users now of that because we've done the work in both digitizing it and indexing it so people can find the content and promoting it and making sure that people find it. Thanks very much indeed, Gary. Really interesting stuff. Let's turn to, to David. Um, we'll talk about blood. We've got a lot of interest. I think uh, several people are interested in, you know, what the further uses of this, these discoveries will be. So Dave Blaker, for example, asked, could this research have any application relating to individual susceptibility regarding infections such as COVID, separate from age and existing conditions? And also another question, uh, which was a, um, a, an anonymous one, was what the future holds for you know, leukemia, fingerprints in inverted commas, or predisposition indices for children and young adults. So could you say a little bit more about what the implications are for, for what kind of things your, your work might, might make possible in the future? And I'm aware that you're a scientist, so you're probably going to be a bit uh, tentative about over-promising, but um, give us an idea of what we might be able to hope for. Sure thing. Uh, so, so Julian, I think probably the, the biggest thing to say is that cancer genetics in general is an absolutely massive field. And there are huge developments in terms of personalized medicine, understanding which mutations in which genes actually drive the cancers. And, and so there, there are very common clinical assays now in place where people go in, get a sample taken, and they very quickly get uh, sort of categorized into a high risk or a low risk based on that. And, and so, so iterations of that are certainly something that, that is, is very exciting from a clinical point of view, moving towards personalized medicine. On this idea of coronavirus research, uh, in particular with the family tree of blood kind of approach, I think there's probably some scope for understanding how the immune system adapts to the exposure to the virus itself and how it evolves over time. And so one of the big questions that we are positioned to answer at least is how many stem cells might have existed before and are they more or less exhausted, so to speak, based on having been exposed to the virus. And that, that's quite an exciting area of research because there's been a recent discovery that as we age normally, we get a reduced number of stem cells contributing to blood cell production. And so whether or not a viral exposure will accelerate that process, there's sort of questions around long COVID and things like this. They're, they're really quite fascinating and, and in their infancy. Now, in order to do that, you would have to have sort of samples banked down from people prior to and after the exposure to coronavirus. Uh, but in some cases, those sample sets do exist because people have been banking samples so effectively from normal individuals as well as, as diseased uh, individuals. And so I think there's a real opportunity to use these powerful tools in genomic medicine to answer some of these questions. And I'm really impressed by the standard of questions being asked <laughs> in, in, this, uh, in this particular forum uh, from sort of 300 random people across, uh, across Yorkshire or probably even the world. So, so well done to you, attendees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we may, we'll get through as, as many as we can. We may have another one for you if we've got time for it, but I want to sort of make sure I sort of spread the questions around. So let's, let's turn to, to Jasper and your, your new economics. Again, it's interesting how you get sort of similar uh, questions on similar areas. And one is around population growth. So an anonymous attendee asked about um, whether these new models of economics, how they treat the idea of popular gro population growth and population control. And related to that, Bob um, asks, you know, what is your view on the thought that the current economic system demands population growth so the young can pay for the care of the old and so forth. So again, population, how does that fit into this new economic model? Yeah, I mean, conventionally, uh, you can ascribe about half of pop, uh, half of economic growth historically to population growth. So obviously, if there's more people, then there's more people consuming, more people producing, and that generates economic growth. So economic growth is about, you know, kind of roughly uh, half 
generated by population growth and half generated by other uh, things, you know, productivity growth, really. So, um, you know, so what you can expect is that when, an, when, when a country starts to grow more slowly in terms of population, um, that, that, that the economy starts to grow uh, uh, more slowly as well. And you can see that in countries like, like Japan. And I, I guess this is what I was kind of hinting at in my current talk, that uh, this old economic reliance on growth then puts pressure on, uh, on, 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 on not having your population decline too much because it pushes growth down. Um, you know, I think that fundamentally a problem in all the economics is we focus too much on, on exchange values. Uh, we don't focus enough in, in terms of, for example, looking at demographic questions in the developed world, in countries like the UK, um, you know, what is it that we actually need to take care of old people? And, and it's not money. Fundamentally, what we don't, what we need is people who are qualified uh, in terms of healthcare. We need trained people. Um, you know, and we need a, a productive uh, uh, economy. Um, if you have productivity and you have education, you have skill, then, uh, then, then you've got what you need to take care of old people. It's really quite irrelevant how, you know, how much your, uh, uh, your economy growth or even your population um, uh, grows. Um, at the same time, I think when we look at uh, globally, uh, population growth is obviously uh, a, a one of the drivers behind um, environmental impacts. Um, so we do have to tackle it, but um, you know, fundamentally, the, the big question is how affluent are these people? Um, and it's people who are more affluent have a vastly more uh, higher environmental impact than people who are less affluent. Uh, at the same time, if we're, if we're looking at um, tackling um, population growth, we really kind of need to come back to this question of inequality. Uh, more equal societies are more likely to be able to uh, to stabilize their, their their population. Why? Because um, there's two really key drivers behind population growth, or two key ways of tackling population growth. The first is providing some kind of social safety net that's not having lots of children, and the second is having educated women. Um, having the more we educate women. Um, a, the more they will be likely to, to have less children, but they will also have them later in life because they go through that education process. And we, you know, initially when you think about population, you think, well, how many children are you gonna have? But just as crucial is how long are you going to take before you have children? If you have children at the age of 18, that encourages population to grow to grow much faster than if you have uh, children at the age of 25 or 30. Um, so really tackling that kind of gender inequality and, and, and income social inequality is, is, is crucial. Um, and I think that's where, you, you know, what, what, where, where, where all the economics is, is, is still failing because we continuing to see inequality increase in, in a large proportion of the world. But very briefly, because I want to get on to a question for Kate, but um, just want to ask a clarification question, because one of the themes is about growth. And a, a person here has asked, um, you know, how do you sell the idea of new economics to a world which is focused on growth expectations? But I'm wondering whether perhaps uh, your, your life is made more difficult for people advocating what you're saying because you're seen as anti-growth. Is it, isn't it rather that we've got the wrong idea of what growth is? If we can do twice as much with half the resources, that's growth in capacity, isn't it? It's not growth in GDP, but there's a growth in our capacity. And that's not the same thing. So uh, do you think perhaps you shoot yourself in the foot by being seen as the anti-growth party, as it were? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm not anti-growth, uh, but, but I'm anti-GDP. I think GDP mm. is a failed indicator uh, of progress. So I'm agnostic about growth. I think that, uh, you know, obviously some sectors need to uh, grow, um, like education in developing countries, like green energy in developed countries and in developing countries. So some sectors need to grow. Other sectors need to shrink, like fossil fuels. You know, so, 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 it's, so looking at this at, a, at the scale of whole economies doesn't really make any sense. And GDP is a poor indicator of, of progress and well-being. So if we ditch GDP, the whole question of growth becomes kind of less relevant, um, except where you come into this question of um, kind of financial stability and how do you deal with, with, with that. And if you're ad addicted to economic growth, i.e. an increase in exchanges in the markets because money is created at debt, as debt, uh, then, then you run into trouble. So in order to kind of get rid of GDP as an indicator, we do need to tackle some other underlying issues within uh, the way our economy works. Um, but yeah, fundamentally, you know, it's good to grow some things, right? Uh, and, and other things, we, we, we don't want to grow them. 
Great, thank you very much. Let's turn, let's turn to Kate. Now, Kate, you've really fired uh, the interest of people here. I think people have got such a curiosity to find out more. And if we weren't in a lockdown, I think we'd all be um, booking our, our mini breaks in Pickering. I know I'm, it's now on my destination hit list. But we've got some quite interesting questions about some you know, quite specific things. So Lydia Ebden, for example, is asking you about these figures in the painting. Are they all from the Bible? Are, are some unexplained? And she also points out that some of these figures are with black people, which is interesting. Can we tell if they were black originally? whether that was changed in a restoration and, and what does it tell us that there are some black figures in, in these paintings so could you Kate tell us a bit more about these these figures yes thank thank you so much um, and thanks for the questions um, yes uh, from what we can tell particularly I think Lydia you're referring to the St Catherine scenes there is an attempt to show the stories um, these are more drawn from sermon exemplar and books of stories of saints like the Golden Legend or the South English Legendary than they were the Bible per se. And there is obviously an interest and attempt to show uh, many of these stories which were set in the Far East, um, stories of St George, for example. You asked a very interesting question about were people racist in the Middle Ages? Um, there are lots of attitudes I think across history and centuries and Gary has talked about this a little bit in the archives too where we uh, where we find very common um, attitudes in the past and present some of which make us uncomfortable um, but equally I would uh, draw you back to another of the projects that the university has been involved with the English immigrants project for example um, spearheaded by the, the late lamented Mark Ormrod where we know that there's a huge diversity of population in villages, towns and cities in medieval England. So people would have been coming into contact with lots of other people. So I think that um, that doesn't really specifically tell us anything about attitudes in, in Pickering. Um, and I think there's another very interesting question in the Q and A's about, about the North of England. And that I think I would also want to say in the Middle Ages, uh, places like Pickering are absolutely at the heart of a very interesting cultural nexus of monastic libraries. Uh, we have some fantastically interesting figures with great personal libraries in the north of England at the time. So it's not a it's not a cultural backwater. In terms of um, the uh, questions, I think there's one from Mike about how common wall paintings like this were. They are everywhere. So we, you know, we know that every single medieval parish church would have had these kinds of painted schemes. And that's why the Victorians have such a bad reputation, because when they restored churches in the 19th century, just like Pickering, uh, they, they liked to, to remove the plaster. And that's why we have lost so much of this artistic heritage from many churches across England. Um, and that's a, that's a great shame. And I mean, again, promoting the Borthwick uh, Institute for Archives, many of the drawings and, and images I've shown you in records are at the Borthwick or North Allerton, or indeed with the parish themselves. So we're really lucky to have this remarkable surviving correspondence drawings. So Pickering is pretty unique for the combination of sources we have available. Now, it's always a bit tricky to to ask anyone to answer a question really on Zoom because people quite don't know quite how to, to do it. But someone can just jump in on this. Um, something Gary said earlier on, he was talking about how, you know, the archives show that this isn't kind of just pure research. And but what I thought was quite interesting about that was how surprising some of the impacts can be. There's a lot of pressure now on academics to have impact but I don't think I don't think you could have foreseen some of the impact of uh, the, the, the stuff you, you talked about Gary and I, I wonder whether whether you have any thoughts about whether or not um, you know there is a, how important it is for you as academics and as researchers and as archivists to really be thinking about impact um, and how much is important perhaps some, sometimes just to pursue things almost for their own sake, because you never know what it will, will lead to. This is a highly kind of politicised of the small p issue at the moment in higher education, I know, but I'm fascinated. Would any, of you, any of you like to take that one on? Raise a finger if you do. Oh, right, Kate will. Oh, well, I'll come back. I, I guess that was my end point, really. And I'm, I'm sure there are lots of Pickering friends who've been watching this afternoon. If you work in a with a community's history, um, and that could be anywhere in the world. And many of our colleagues in archaeology, history, history of art do that. Anywhere you work with a community and their cultural heritage, 
you can't help but have impact because as soon as you meet that community and start thinking about the stories you want to tell from the archives or the material culture, they are absolutely on board and, and sharing their own stories with you. So I think um, impact is something that many colleagues in the arts and humanities have been doing for many years. It's, it's, it's got a name now, but I think for many of us, we, we, we used to just do it, um, but we didn't necessarily see it as something we would publish or talk about overtly. Um, and I think it's something we've warmly welcomed. I think Gary would probably say the same, that Borthwick has such a long history of welcoming people into, into its archives. So, yeah. I mean, just a final question, which I do feel free to come back to the other one if any of the others have something to add to that. But another thing that struck me is, particularly looking at David's work, I imagine that there's a hell of a lot of very, very slow, patient, painstaking stuff going on here. Now, in these talks, you're presenting, in a sense, the exciting conclusions. And uh, we're very keen to tell everyone everything's exciting these days. But, I mean, if people are thinking about sort of following any of you in your career paths, how much do they have to be prepared, actually, for a lot of very slow, painstaking work? I mean, frankly, is are your days often quite boring? Is that the price you have to pay for these sort of moments of excitement? Or are there little, little micro excitements every single day? Um, who'd like to take that one on? Well, I can start on that. I mean, certainly the, the excitement of discovery is, is something that motivates, I would say, all of us researchers, right? Like having an idea for the first time, pursuing that idea, seeing if you're right or wrong, these sorts of things. Uh, and, and in some ways, your question touches on something that, that was just talked about in Kate's answer. And that is that in you know, science, we can make a, a compelling story that it's relevant to medicine, right? Because we work on DNA. But actually, most of what scientists do is very blue sky research. It's about pursuit of ideas that may or may not work out. And, and the vast majority of ideas don't work out. You know, how many academics have been down you know, hundreds of rabbit holes and, and just gotten lost forever? Uh, and this, this is the process of discovering something new. If it was easy, we'd have it done already, so to speak. And, and so, so I think the, that's shared across academic space. And it's not something that, that you can just simply say science is relevant to human health and therefore important in all aspects. And, and you know, maybe that, as Kate was saying, that case hasn't been made in the arts, but if, if there was a step back from it, it could be made. And, and, and uh, yeah, I, I think there's, there's a lot to learn there. Great. So yes, we have boring days. <laughs> We've got uh, to wrap up. Jasper, 30, Jasper, the one getting 30 seconds for Jasper, just for a final point. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that, that where we are struggling is at the other end of the spectrum in some sense that uh, obviously our, our research is very uh, applied um, and where you get into that area is, you know, what we do is quite normative um, and we don't pretend to uh, be some kind of value neutral um, kind of observer of the economic system. Now we say the economic system is a matter of political choice um, and the kind of economic principles that you choose for your models will influence the outcomes, etc. Uh, whereas a lot of old economics is still uh, kind of tied to that idea of being a neutral observer, uh, but then takes a whole range of kind of assumptions that uh, um, uh, that are not neutral at all. Um, so sometimes we struggle to to get funding, for example, and saying uh, with with comments like, uh, "Well, your work is more advocacy than research." Um, so so you can also struggle on the other side. But just that kind of earlier question of, um, you know, how do you actually go through this whole barrier of, of, of growth dependency and how do you make an impact as several people asked in the Q&A. Um, you know, I think there's, there's very much a question of uh, you know, building a coalition of the willing. Um, so for example, there's a counterpart to G7 being built up, uh, which is called the Wellbeing Economies Alliance with countries like New Zealand and Wales and Scotland, uh, Iceland, um, and, 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 and where there is an interest in this kind of stuff. Uh, and where there's an active drive for, for more and more implementation of these ideas. So rather than convincing everybody at the same time, trying to build a vanguard uh, who's showing like, well, actually, if we take on these ideas, apply them in our economies, we're all better off. And that provides some kind of inspiration uh, for a better society. And then more people will, will take that on. Well, look, thanks very much indeed. Um, Gary Brown and David Kent, Jesper Kenter, Kate Giles, all being a uh, Wonderful, fascinating talks. Thanks to all the team behind the scenes as well, who have been absolutely wonderful in making this flow well to Joan and everybody. Um, I've really enjoyed it. And I need to hand over now, finally, final word from the university's chancellor, Sir Malcolm Grant. 
Well, thank you very much, Julian. It has been an absolutely wonderful day. I've followed the University of York from a small village this morning with Lindsay Stringer in Aswatini, uh, formerly Swaziland. We ended up in a small village uh, this afternoon with Kate Giles. Uh, in the meantime, we visited another small village uh, in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, where Matt Thomas has been working on the control of uh, mosquito-borne malaria. So um, beyond that, though, we've had this extraordinary array of modern technologies merging uh, with the small village. We are truly going from the global to the local and back again. And we have seen, of course, uh, the engagement with uh, modern technologies such as uh, global work collaborating with NASA on understanding what's been the impact on emissions as a consequence of COVID uh, to the work that David's just recently been talking about uh, in relation to uh, whole genome sequencing. So it makes me ask, what is it that allows a university to do this? Because you shouldn't understand, you shouldn't just assume that every university in the world can actually do this. They can't. Uh, we have, I think, in across Europe, a fragmentation of universities and research activities, which doesn't lend itself to this wonderful multidisciplinary work. Uh, we have in America, of course, some fabulous universities are very well funded, um, but which often have the size which prevents them from having the intimacy that we enjoy at the University of York, and often also vulnerability to the predilections of donors who push research in different ways and drive people down. Uh, highly rewarding uh, rabbit holes but lack uh, the intellectual wealth and richness that York has. So it seems to me that there are two or three elements. One is size. Uh, this is a university of just the right size where people can know each other and can know each other's work and are willing to work together. They don't have the prima donnas, well at least not so many of the prima donnas that some of, of some of the great universities of the world. And so we get the thrill of a day like this. It's, it's almost an internal seminar of the University of York in which everybody does a talent show. And yet we know it's also attracted an enormous audience from elsewhere. So my role finally is simply to extend the votes of thanks to four main groups. Group number one, obviously, is all the speakers. Well, I, I've just been glued to my screen all day. I found it absolutely fascinating. Uh, secondly, to the chairs of each of the sessions, to Jen Gale, to Wanda Wepusoka, uh, to Rory Sutton Jones and to you, Julian uh, Virginie. Thirdly, of course, to the backstage team. I'm not going to even name the backstage team. They know who they are, uh, but they've done a wonderful job in planning, uh, in getting the speakers to agree to present, in joining up the loose ends, in overseeing the presentation, and ensuring that the logistics of the day have gone so smoothly, including the IT. And then finally, to the attendees, I think. Somebody just referred to them as 300 random people, and I think that's a, a wonderful description. Uh, but an audience who sadly have not been able to see and to work with uh, behind the scenes, but from whom we've had some of the most stimulating questions that we could imagine. So on behalf of the whole university, my thanks to you, our audience, and my thanks to everybody who's made this day such a success. Thank you very much.